go put the nuclear. You can't see it or hear it, but Wi-Fi blankets our homes, our cities and our schools. Children today are growing up in a sea of radio frequency microwave radiation that did not exist five years ago. Our safety agencies dispute that wireless devices like mobile phones cause harm. I don't think it's good enough to say at the moment that mobile phone use does cause, uh, does cause cancer. Cell phones emit pulsed radiation. And just... But some of the world's leading scientists and industry insiders are breaking ranks to warn us of the risks. There is an association between heavy mobile phone use and brain tumours. I've been in the technology industry all my career and I've seen the tremendous benefits that technology can provide. My concern is nobody can say that it's safe. Do mobile phones cause brain cancer? And is Wi-Fi making us sick? In this episode, I investigate the latest research and advice about the safety of our modern wireless devices. The digital revolution has transformed our lives. Phones, tablets, watches and laptops, all connected to wireless networks. We use these devices to make calls, send texts, write emails, play music, take photos, and even watch TV. In fact, chances are you could be watching this on your wireless device right now. We've gone from the equivalent of the horse and buggy to the jet in about 10 years. The transformation in technology has been without precedence. The devices that are held directly next to the body, the mobile phone, the cordless phone are the ones we are most concerned about. When US cancer epidemiologist Dr. Deborah Davis was first told about the risks of mobile phones, her reaction was predictable disbelief. I said, what are you talking about? There's no problem. If there were a problem, I would know about it. Because of course I was working at the National Academy of Sciences. I was working at the Cancer Institute, a professor of epidemiology at the University of Pittsburgh. And I frankly thought, there's nothing to this. Then, however, I began to look. And the more I looked, the more concerned I became. Dr. Davis has had a distinguished career as a presidential appointee for the Clinton administration and is recognized internationally for her work on environmental health and disease prevention. She was recently in Australia holding a series of public seminars. People are assuming everything's fine until we have evidence that we are in the middle of a disaster. Today, there's over 6 billion phone subscriptions worldwide. Many of them smartphones, with apps that frequently receive and transmit electromagnetic signals. In a similar way, the human body has electromagnetic fields. Electrical currents flow through nerve fibres and muscle tissue, and external interference can disrupt those signals. Our heart and our brain are electric. We need to understand that exposing our electric body to mobile phone radiation for thousands of minutes a month, for hundreds of hours, over a lifetime, it's going to have a biological effect on you. In fact, the BlackBerry comes with a warning. It says, if you have a pacemaker implanted in your chest, keep the mobile device at least 20 centimeters away. Well, your heart is a pacemaker, whether you have a machine in it or not. So obviously you want to protect your heart and the rest of your body. Finnish radiation biologist Dr. Darius Lazinski is an internationally recognised expert in radiation safety and has been an advisor to the WHO on such matters. He says most people with a smartphone nowadays may be unwittingly breaching the safety limits of their device. Sometimes a person puts cell phone in a pocket which are connected to internet, then safety limits are being breached and this cell phone doesn't comply with safety regulation once it is put in pocket. Phones are manufactured to ensure the radiation they emit can't overheat the body and cause thermal damage. It's called the specific absorption rate. But during testing, 
the phone is positioned at a distance away from the model body. Therefore, when you place your smartphone in your pocket directly against your body, you may be exceeding the safety standard. In order to comply with safety standards, the cell phone has to be at some distance from body. So it's fair to say that sometimes people would be breaching the safety standard of their mobile yes. phones every day. Yes. That's quite shocking. I don't think people are aware of this information. Uh, because nobody is talking about it, uh, including uh, radiation safety authorities. They uh, simply don't mention it. Electromagnetic radiation is everywhere. We have always been exposed to natural sources like the sun, but there are some sources of radiation that are man-made. Today, with the proliferation of mobile and wireless technology and devices that emit artificial radio frequency radiation, some claim we're exposed to levels up to a quintillion times higher than natural background levels. The spectrum of electromagnetic radiation ranges from ionising radiation, like X-rays, which have enough energy to knock electrons out of their orbit and cause cancer, to non-ionising radiation, like microwaves, which have much less energy and considered to be safer. Mobile phones, tablets, phone towers, smart meters, baby monitors and Wi-Fi routers are all sources of radio frequency microwave radiation. Professor Bruce Armstrong was part of an expert panel on radiation, which gathered for the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC. The panel was tasked with analysing whether radio frequency radiation could cause cancer. Its decision was essentially that it possibly causes cancer. That means radio frequency radiation is now classified as a class 2B possible human carcinogen. It was inevitably a controversial decision. What was your personal decision? I thought that, that I got it right based on the evidence. Heavy users are defined as those who talk on a mobile 30 minutes a day for longer than 10 years. Journalists like myself, tradespeople, brokers, even teenagers would easily meet that definition these days. Yeah. So I went to our Panza, our federal agency responsible for protecting us from the harmful effects of radiation. I asked one of their physicists, Dr. Ken Karapetis, for his view on IARC's decision. On a personal level, I don't think it should be a 2B. Um, other people say it should be higher. Dr. Karapetis says there's no cause for concern. We've been doing research in this area for, for a very long time and our assessment of the evidence suggests that although some studies do show effects, there is no established evidence that the low levels of radio frequency radiation from tablets and phones and Wi-Fi and what have you causes health effects. So our Panzer's not actually saying that these devices are safe? We can only provide advice on an assessment of the evidence um, we do not provide guarantees of safety. I don't think a scientist can do that. In Ontario is the former head of Microsoft Canada, Frank Clegg. He has gained valuable insight into the machinations of the tech industry. I've been in the technology industry all my career and I've seen the tremendous benefits that technology can provide. My concern is Nobody can say that it's safe. All my industry and all government agencies say is there's no proof of harm. And to my mind, that's not the same, the same as saying it's safe. Mr. Clegg points out the safety standard only protects people from thermal damage that can occur through overheating. But scientists have demonstrated that radiation-emitting devices can cause DNA damage without heating tissue. These are non-thermal effects. Unfortunately, the safety standards in, in North America and in Australia are, are based on this theory that's many decades old that if tissue doesn't get heated, then it can't cause harm. And that's just out of date. And what the biologists tell us and have shown in many, many experiments, and again, peer-reviewed published papers, 
that there is damage done at the DNA level and from a biological standpoint, it's non-thermal radiation can cause and does cause harm to humans. For example, there is strong evidence to suggest that mobile phones can damage sperm, as might occur when a male keeps his smartphone in his pocket. If you take sperm from a healthy man and you put sperm in one test tube which gets no exposure to a mobile phone and the other gets exposure, the mobile phone exposed sperm die faster, have more damage to their mitochondrial DNA, which is the engine that makes the cell run. And studies around the world consistently find the heaviest cell phone users have the lowest sperm count. Those studies have not been considered recently uh, in, in reviews, and there are new data emerging all the time. This bioinitiative report sets out hundreds of peer-reviewed papers confirming the biological changes caused by wireless transmitting devices, which can occur thousands of times below the safety threshold. It has been formulated by independent doctors and scientists from over 10 different countries. But our Panzer has a different view. There's certainly some studies that have shown effects on sperm, but there's many other studies that haven't. There is no consistent evidence that there's established biological effects other than rising temperature. So the evidence is really inconsistent, and, and it's not good enough at the moment to, to say that uh, mobile phones do affect uh, sperm. <laughs> IARC's decision in 2011, more evidence has emerged which adds strength to their findings. The Serenat study and Hardell study both found a link between heavy mobile phone use and rare head tumours. Those studies do suggest rather more strongly than the body of evidence available to IARC at the time that there is an association between heavy mobile phone use and brain tumours. These studies have sparked calls for the classification to be upgraded from 2B to 2A. My colleagues and I since then, some of whom have worked at the World Health Organization with me in the past, have just published an article saying that mobile phone radiation is a probable human carcinogen, with newer studies showing that people who begin to use cell phones regularly and heavily as teenagers have four to eight times more malignant glioma, that's a brain tumor, 10 years later. The fear about mobile phones causing brain tumours is not a new debate. Previously, industry co-funded a study hoping to settle the debate once and for all. The Interphone study was carried out from 2000 to 2004. The results were supposed to be released in 2005. It took five years to release the results of the Interphone study. And it was not because the science wasn't clear. It was because of the intense politics that took place between members of the team, some of whom had been heavily sponsored by industry and others of whom were more independent. The bulk of the study said the results were inconclusive. The actual findings in Technical Appendix 2 showed that there was a significantly increased risk of brain cancer in the heaviest users. Mobile phone manufacturers themselves are aware of the potential risks, which is why they recently put warnings in each device. Well, first you go to settings, mm -hmm. and then you go to general. Mm -hmm. Then you go to about at the top. Yeah. Then you have to look hard. You have to go all the way down. It's something called legal. Yes. And then you go to RF exposure. Oh, of course, I've never been in the, into this part of my phone. <laughs> well, there you see, it says to reduce exposure to RF energy, use a hands-free option, such as the built-in speakerphone. Yours says carry iPhone at least 10 millimeters away from your body. Mine says at least five millimeters. What do you think about this warning? I think the warning is, I think they're being a bit hypocritical to be trying to get you to buy more and more free talk time and then telling you you should limit your exposures. It's not only telco companies who are cautious about potential risks. 
Insurance giant Lloyds of London excludes cover for illnesses caused by electromagnetic radiation. When it comes to microwave transmitters like mobile phone towers, several other countries around the world have maintained more stringent safety thresholds compared to Australia. We know that China, Italy and Switzerland and Russia have standards 100 times safer than Canada's standards. And that's the same as Australia's standards. It sparked concerns that our Panzer is out of touch with the latest evidence. When was the last time our Panzer updated their safety standards? We uh, published the standard in 2002, but we, we did a review of the science that underpins the standard uh, in 2014. Now, the review actually found that the limits of the standard still provide uh, adequate protection uh, from the known health effects of radio frequency energy. Any government agency, in my opinion, that has done a review in the last two or three years and hasn't made a significant change to their safety standard has not done a proper thorough review of the science. And if you think back to what happened in the last decade, the, the cell phone, the smartphone was launched, right? Wi-Fi was not available 12 years ago. So any government agency that claims that their standards that are a decade old our current is, is, is out of date. When it comes to mobile phone risk, our Panzer quotes brain cancer rates in the Australian population, which they say refutes the idea that mobile phones cause brain cancer. We've looked at the brain tumour rates for the last 30 years. The brain tumour rates have remained quite stable. I confronted Dr Davis with this data while she was here in Australia. Those who say the lack of increase in brain cancer tells you cell phones are safe, don't understand brain cancer. It has a long latency. When the bombs fell at the end of World War II on Japan, we followed every person who survived. 40 years is how long it took for brain cancer to develop after that exposure. Since cell phone use has exponentially increased only in the last five to 10 years, Dr. Davis says it's far too early to rule out the possibility that mobile phones are causing a problem in the general population. There is no cause of cancer in the environment that shows up in the general population in 10 years. Not asbestos, not tobacco, not DES, not benzene. None of them shows up in 10 years. So of course we don't see any increase in brain cancer now. There's none expected. Dr. Davis says if you want a more accurate picture of what's happening with brain cancer rates, you have to look more closely at specific groups rather than the general population rates. When you look at specific groups, however, you are seeing an increase in younger brain cancers in certain types, in certain locations. Although brain cancer is rare, the latest US figures show a statistically significant increase in malignant and non-malignant brain and spinal cord tumors in adolescents. This doesn't mean it's caused by mobile phones, but it may be a factor. Brain surgeon Charlie Teo recently attended the seminar where Dr. Davis was presenting her evidence. He brought along his surgical team. As a primary care physician at the coalface of patients with brain cancer, I think it's my responsibility to try and look for some potential causes of brain cancer and if we find any at all, to make the public aware of them. The biggest single exposure that a person gets is through their mobile or cordless phone use. There is some epidemiological evidence of a possible association between prolonged mobile phone use uh, and certain brain tumours. That evidence is not good enough to say mobile phones do cause cancer, but the possibility remains. So there is merit uh, for those that are concerned um, in reducing your exposure to mobile phone use against the head. And in fact, we'll provide advice in, in doing that, you know, by yeah. using a hands-free yeah. kit or putting the phone on speaker mode or various other ways. Now, when it comes to children, there's not enough evidence in this area. So our recommendation is slightly stronger. We, we, we do recommend that parents limit their, their children's mobile phone use. In a statement, the Australian mobile telecommunications industry says there's no evidence of any additional risk to children from mobile phone technologies. But the research relating to children is limited, so the possibility of harm cannot be ruled out. It increases heat shock proteins, it increases reactive oxygen.
Dr Davis's campaign has provoked criticism, but she remains defiant. Are you cherry-picking the data to suit your argument? No, I'm not cherry-picking my work. With respect to mobile phones and brain cancer, the reality is every single well-designed study ever conducted finds an increased risk of brain cancer with the heaviest users. And the range of the risk is between 50% to eightfold. That's a fact. These are rare brain tumors like malignant glioma. And in children, there's virtually no data available. Children today are growing up in a sea of radio frequency radiation, microwave radiation that did not exist five years ago. A child's skull is thinner. Its brain contains more fluid. Things cook in a microwave oven if they have more fluid and more fat in them. So because the skull is thinner and the brain contains more fluid, a child will absorb more radiation relative to that of an adult. Scientists have been able to demonstrate this. So in an adult, what were the results? Well, you can see that the he heaviest radiation here in, is indicated in the red, and it gets just into uh, the first part of the eye and the cheek and the ear, wow. right? So the rest of it doesn't really get that far. Mm -hmm. That's the faintest color. But if you look at the child, this is a three-year-old, you can see that it gets all the way through the head. Wow, so that, that penetrates almost to the other side of the ear. Correct. That's incredible. Yeah, now, it is. Do we know that this translates into health effects for the child? No, we don't. So should we be, should we be concerned? You want to experiment on your children? Go ahead. I don't think we have any reason to think this is a good idea. And in fact, manufacturers are now advising. Uh, Samsung has a statement, a cell phone is not a toy. When it comes to reducing risk, it's all about proximity from the device. Radiation exposure drops off exponentially with distance. Distance is your friend here. And children, of course, infants, should never be close to any of these devices. They've been tested on this big adult guy. They've never been tested for infants and toddlers. Any parent out there that gives their child a device to play with because they're driving them crazy, put it on airplane mode. Because if it's on airplane mode, they can still play the game but they're not sending and receiving microwave radiation. So it's not that it should be no devices, it's just we've got to be more careful about how we use them. I mean, really, when it came to cigarette smoking, we had no idea of the mechanism. Brain surgeon Charlie Teo limits his children's exposure. The kids didn't get them until they were older, post-pubescent. I absolutely forbid them to use it, you know, holding up to their head. They've got to put it on speakerphone or use a device. When they go to bed at night, they, can't, they have to have it at least one arm's length away from their head, not to be under the pillow, not to be on the uh, bedside table. One study involving 14 countries is currently assessing whether use of mobile phones at an early age increases the rates of early onset brain tumours in 1,000 young people. The results will be released this year. Unlike mobile phones, which can be switched off, Wi-Fi exposure is constant. This is the toolbox of the 21st century, OK? The 2008 education revolution under the Rudd government led to the rollout of Wi-Fi routers in public schools across the country. But some parents are concerned about their children's exposure to Wi-Fi in the classroom. So basically, when a child starts high school, they're at school for anywhere from four to six years, and they're sitting in radio frequency, microwave radiation, the 2B possible carcinogen, and the routers are pulsing all day, every day. On top of that, you've got mobile telephones, you've got their laptops, so you've got this whole layering of radio frequency, microwave radiation um, that we've never been exposed to before in the past. So with regards to that layering effect, who's to say what the consequences of that will be for, for that child's long-term future? Unfortunately, we weren't granted access to measure the levels of Wi-Fi radiation in this school. The Department of Education didn't respond directly to our question about the risks of exposing children to Wi-Fi, but they did state that the Australian government is supporting research into the effects of electromagnetic energy on people's health. Libby says parents should not be forced to choose between educating their children and safeguarding them. 
It's almost a case of involuntary consent. In a world where we sign permission slips at school for absolutely everything, um, no, no parent has given their child permission to sit in the 2B possible carcinogen, but yet they're unaware that that's what they're sitting in. Earlier in my career, I, we were on a campaign uh, to get uh, technology into schools, which did include Wi-Fi. So yes, uh, I was a proponent, and I, I wish I had known then what I know now, because I, I, I hope and I believe that my message would have been different. If you can't say it's safe, then you'd be cautious about how you use it. The industry body acknowledges concerns about the greater vulnerability of children during development, because young people will use Wi-Fi for most of their lives unlike this adult generation. But they also say this has already been factored in the safety threshold. While the Australian government's position on Wi-Fi remains unchanged, other countries are making changes. In France, for example, legislation was passed banning Wi-Fi in nurseries and daycare centres. The National Library of France and other libraries in Paris have removed Wi-Fi networks altogether. We do need to create digital citizens, and we want children to know how to use the internet, how to find information. That's all very important. Wherever possible, the Israeli government advises using wired as, not, as opposed to wireless. For schools, we need to go wired whenever possible. Routers right now are programmed that they're on 24-7. There's no reason for that. They ought to have an on and off switch. And it's not just in schools. Nowadays, many homes and offices have Wi-Fi as well. The location of the routers, it's really important. Don't have a router in your bedroom. Don't have a cordless phone next to your bed. Keep these things some distance away. You can set your router in a closet furthest away from where people regularly spend time. That's what you should do. And if you can't avoid it, you're in a small apartment, get in the habit of turning it off certainly when you're sleeping. What we'll do is we'll just turn the router on with our switch. We've basically instituted some simple switches at the high school that would work um, a little bit just like a light switch and it's been trialled in several classrooms where if the teacher needs the computer that lesson they'll basically switch the switch on and the router will start up and if it's not needed they'll, they'll turn it off. So it's, it's quite simple. There is no doubt that, that consumers are confused. There, there are conflicting reports. There is a lot of scientific information out there. Uh, it gets some press coverage, but then it gets countered by industry. I, I am embarrassed to say that I believe my industry is on a campaign to, to bury the science and to confuse the message on the harmful effects of wireless devices. Mr. Clegg is concerned there'll be a repeat of the mistakes from the past. You never had a better one of the best analogies that I've heard in this scenario is using the tobacco model, where you know we know that the first science came out showing that smoking cigarettes caused harm back in the 1960s. And the tobacco industry was able to delay uh, legislation, delay the message to the public for decades. Craven filter, the clean cigarette. I believe that my industry is using that same model and just in, in obfuscating the science, hiring scientists to cast doubt on the, on the uh, science, uh, confusing government and causing government to be uh, to be constipated and not passing the legislation that they need to pass. But when we approached the industry body, they objected to the criticism, saying they have open discussions about the scientific evidence on their website and continue to fund research into the health effects of RF radiation. Do you really want to see proof that we've got millions of people with cancer like we did with tobacco and asbestos? Is there any question we should have acted sooner? We would really make a huge mistake if we continue to take the repeated assurances everything is all right. For more information about the studies mentioned in this program, you can go to our website. <laughs>